The grace of Jesus Christ and peace of God be with you. I'm Pastor Elizabeth Shen O'Connor. I welcome you to Sunday morning worship here at Meadow Springs Presbyterian Church. As we gather our hearts together on this day of worship, I begin with just a reminder to our faith community, those who connect with us here at MSPC, that today at 11, we have our annual congregational meeting. It will be a virtual meeting, and you have the connection information in your Sunday email. So please check it out. Please join us. Again, we will be going over our annual report that was sent to you this week. We will be uh, taking a look at the budget, the 2021 budget that our board session has approved and uh, voting on pastor terms of call. So members have this responsibility, this privilege to be part of the business of the church, but we encourage any and all friends who connect with us to come and be part of the conversations and to hear the many good things, the many good ways in which God has been working in and through us this past year. But for now, I call us to worship through these words. Friends, let us gather this day in silence and hope. We wait for God's word for us. Let our hearts and spirits be open. God is our strength and salvation. Let us wait patiently for the Lord. With willing hearts and spirits, we wait for the Lord. Let us pray. O God, you are our light and our salvation. Living in your presence, we have nothing to fear. Open our hearts to your word this day. As we hear the story of the call of the first disciples, make us ready to follow Jesus on whatever whatever path he leads us. Lord, let us cast aside our fears and doubts. Lord, teach us to trust you wholly. And we ask this in your name, the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, let us join our hearts together this day as we worship a God who loves us, a God who is trustworthy.
This week we marked many events. We marked the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday on Monday, on Wednesday, the inauguration of a new president and vice president. We also marked, I don't know if you caught it, the one-year anniversary of the first case of COVID-19 here in the U.S. So it was quite a week, another week among many, many weeks. But as we gather these thoughts, I invite us to pray for ourselves, our, our ministry as a church, our nation, and our world. Let us pray. Holy God, we praise you as you have brought us through these many events, what we might call storms in our lives in this particular year and in the start of this new year. But as always, you invite us to entrust our lives to you. And so we put our lives in your hands, knowing and fully declaring that you have delivered us and saved us so many times, even from ourselves. And so we ask the same today, that you would be strong and unmistakable in the midst of our faith and ministry, in the midst of our national currents and life, in the midst of this world that you created and so dearly love. We pray for the safe and peaceful transition of power in the highest ranks of our nation. We pray for our president and vice president, as we do for every elected leader, that they would take their responsibilities seriously and work hard to honor our country's values and people. We pray for a divided nation. Bring us to forbearance and unity in the midst of conflict and animosity. Let us be slow to speak, Lord, and quick to listen. Let us be prayerful and humble as we discern your truth in the midst of difference and division, as we are called to right response and action in light of that truth. We pray for the people of this world who continue under threat of this virus. We pray that you would be near to those who grieve the loss of life, the loss of work, the loss of dignity. Protect the many who have risked their lives on the front lines and complete the work of those who have dedicated themselves to finding a solution and ending this pandemic. And strengthen us, your people, mighty God, that we may lead where there is uncertainty, that we may demonstrate peace and unity where there is conflict and division, and that we may be examples of your compassion and trustworthiness. Remind us, great God, of our kingdom responsibilities. Remind us that we have a stake in one another's well-being. And so we can never so easily dismiss a brother or a sister. Finally, we pray, give us strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. In Jesus' name, all God's people pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue walking through the Gospel of John in our sermon series, Come and See. Today we, we are still in the first chapter. We're making our way intentionally, bit by bit. But we pick up today at verse 35 and read through 42. It is that wonderful, uh, from John's perspective, calling of the first disciples. Let us listen to God's Word. The next day, John, that's John the Baptist, was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, 
Where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah. That is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In a seemingly small but significant gesture, John the Baptist points and proclaims another, the Savior. Takes a figurative bow and then goes quietly to his corner of ministry to keep on keeping on with turning the people away from sin and back to God. You know, stepping back after you have been front and center for a time, it can be done well, it can be done with grace, but it is always an adjustment. Maybe you, like me, have been called to step forward to some stretch of capacity in work or in family or in some extracurricular, holding that place for another, for a time being, right? And when the time came, the, came, the person stepped back in or a new person stepped in and you were asked to step back to the role that you occupied before. Have you, have you had this experience it can be done well, it can be done with grace, but if we're honest, it is an adjustment. Let me be clear, this passage, while it signals the rise of Jesus and the stepping back of John, it's not the Baptist's swan song. John continues to do the work God has called him to do. John continues to teach his disciples and to help the people become clear about what is expected of them and who is before them. John's witness has been unfolding intentionally since we first heard of him. Right? He began life as a twinkle in the eyes of his mother and father, angelically announced to be set aside for greater things, removed to the wilderness to focus his thoughts and to clarify his ministry, and then a return back to public life to start the hands-on ministry. And then now, as we have been reading, directed everyone's eyes toward the horizon to see Jesus, the Messiah. Intentional step-by-step -step witness. As we've been talking, for John to be effective in his call and in his ministry here, he must tackle any spike of self-importance, any spike of self-ambition. He's got a job to do, and it entails Jesus' name being circulated above and beyond his own. He's gained some renown. People know this John, John the Baptist, calling people to repentance. But what's called for now, what's demanded of him now, is to put forward Jesus and Jesus' name above and beyond his own. But he's not altogether out of it. You know, he'll come up now and again as a reminder that witnesses have work to do. And there's no retirement in it. What starts to land in our passage today is the fact that a witness isn't complete until others are brought to the person that they are witnessing to. And in this case, that is Jesus. Two of John's disciples become interested in what interests John. They see John point and their eyes follow. Soon their, their feet follow. And then later on, their hearts follow Jesus. 
At first, these two are unnamed. Further on, we learn that one is Andrew, one of the twelve, and that he involves his brother Simon, who becomes Peter. In other Gospels, we see Jesus calling his followers literally from their boats, from their places of work. Here, there's a difference. Here in John's Gospel, we see him captivate these people, even as they are in the midst of other, albeit important, but other commitments. Jesus has a habit of doing this, interrupting our important work and compelling us to pay attention. I confess it's easy for me to become distracted with the work before me. I know that sounds like contradictory terms, but bear with me. Hear me out. In our work life, in our family life, in our home life, in our church life, the day-to-day tasks can be such that we have or leave little room for the unexpected. Many years ago, a colleague of mine shared the reflection that something like 30% of his work calendar was unscheduled. What he meant by this was that a portion of any given day or any given week, something unexpected could and usually did occur. A call from a troubled congregant, maybe a visit to the hospital, or something that just demanded his immediate attention. Now, his wife's response when she heard him say this was, well, why then? Why then do you schedule 100% of your time? That's a valid question. I would say, though, it's not just pastors, but all of us who can do this. We fill our work. We fill our life. We fill our home. We fill our, our ministry to capacity leaving little room for the unexpected. Now, you may well be asking, what is wrong with this? It's normal. Everyone does this. But what I want to say is that the shadow side of this practice, this habit, whatever, the shadow side is in leaving little room for the unexpected. We leave little room for God to work. In the tyranny of the urgent, God's will be done in us can suffer. Thank God, though, that John and John's disciples didn't let the tasks of the moment distract them from seeing the possibility in Jesus before them. Amen? In fact, what Jesus offers his followers, it can't be conveyed in a soundbite. It can't be taught in a lunchtime webinar. I don't know if you're like me, sometimes I squeeze those in, in that lunch hour, right? But in confronting Andrew and the other disciple, Jesus begins by asking something we wouldn't expect. He doesn't ask, who do you want? Or who is it that you are looking for? Rather, what do you want? Some other versions say, what are you seeking? Jesus also has a habit of cutting through small talk. What is it that brings you to me? He's really asking here. And that that is a soul-searching kind of question. It's not the only time that in confronting Jesus, a person is turned back to themselves to do some inner reflection. Happens quite a bit in Jesus' encounters. In confronting Jesus, we too have often been compelled to see ourselves, to search our hearts, to refine our desires. I have to think Andrew and his friend might have been hard-pressed to come up with the words in response to such a question. They sort of come off in the story as two who are simply caught up in the moment Maybe they don't know what has brought them to Jesus exactly. We don't always, that's for sure. We don't always know what brings us to Jesus, what 
brings us to church, what may bring us to a time of confession. Sometimes we're at a loss for words. But it's still an important question to ask. What are we seeking? So maybe that's why they don't answer. They can't find the words in that moment. And what they choose to do then in light of this is to pose a question to Jesus' question. Teacher, they say, where are you staying? This goes deeper than asking for a hotel recommendation. They're interested in staying on with him for a little while. They have some sense at least that getting to know Jesus and what he's about won't be quick work. And Jesus, true to this conversation, doesn't offer the quick fix, but rather Jesus offers that invitation that we've been hearing repeated over and over. It's become a refrain early on here in the Gospel of John. Come and see. What they'll find in time is that the answer to their question about where Jesus dwells will be both a confession of his and his condemnation. You see, when Jesus gathers his disciples together for their last meal, he'll speak to this very thing, where he dwells. And for that, he uses the imagery of the vine and the branches. Do you remember this? It says, I am the vine and my father is the gardener. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, Jesus says, and to his disciples, you are the branches. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. The place where Jesus dwells is of utmost concern because God is there. But so too anyone who would seek to be Jesus' follower. In the end, we understand that Jesus is not simply inviting these two over for dinner, but to relationship. That time dwelling with Jesus can't be rushed and it can't be sidestepped. Andrew gives a witness to his time with Jesus. He tells his brother Simon. He brings Simon to the one Andrew has called Messiah. And in that moment, Simon's destiny is revealed. He is Peter, the rock on whom Jesus is going to build the church. It's like it all unfolds right there before him in the giving of that new name. Lives interrupted. Relationships made that will change the course of their future. God brings us along to certain points in our journey of faith only to set us on another path, a path that ultimately takes us further in faith. But the horizon of what's to come isn't always so clear, and we have to be willing to be patient. You know, decades ago, there was a study done of of children where those who were offering the study put one marshmallow on a plate before various children. But they told them that if they waited 15 more minutes, instead of one marshmallow, they would get two marshmallows. This study, which, as you can tell, measured self or delayed gratification in children, found that the children who chose to wait, who chose to be patient and, and get those two marshmallows, grew up with the same characteristics that were correlated with achievement in school and achievement in life. In some, in some other words, it was, there was a connection, right, between that ability to wait and be patient, to delay that gratification that blessing of the marshmallows, and their ability to work hard and endeavor, perhaps even against all odds, at a later point in their lives. There are no quick fixes in faith. 
as much as we would pray for them, wish for them, long for them. Those stories are rare. Coming to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ doesn't resolve all of our problems or make us better people in the instant that we believe. We are, however, invited into a relationship that that will, if we let it, change the course of our lives and bring us to deep joy and to rich blessing. If we let it. Because nurturing relationship takes time. And it can never be sidestepped. It can never be rushed. Friends, as I close out on this portion of our worship, I invite us to confession. Would you humble your hearts with me as we put our lives and open our hearts before our God? Let us pray. God of grace, we listen to the stories of the call of the disciples and find them interesting. But even as we work to connect them to our lives today, we ask for your guidance in it. For Lord, we look at our own lives. We believe that we could not leave everything, not leave those commitments as we hear told of these disciples in our passage today. We have many responsibilities, many ties which keep us from following fully, but God, you are persistent. God, you understand our confusion and doubts. God, you continue to call us to be in ministry and mission in this world. Now, it may not mean leaving everything behind, but it does mean, and we hear this in your word, being willing to serve wherever you call. And we confess, God, that that is hard. That is hard work to do. We want to place conditions on that call and on how we serve because discipleship is difficult. So forgive us, Lord. Be patient and persistent for the very many times we turn our backs on serving you and focus on our own comforts, our own relief. Forgive us when we look the other way when people are in need. Forgive us our angry attitudes and actions which hurt rather than heal. Wrap your arms around us, healing our wounds and binding us to you. Gently move us into service in your name. Lord, bid us come and see. Help us follow you. Amen. We hear these words of assurance, too, that do not be afraid. God is with you. This is good news. You do not have to go through life alone, wondering if anyone cares about you or knows your heart. God knows. God loves you. God loves us all. So let us rejoice. Let us continue to be the love of God in this world. Amen and amen.
Friends, in this time, let us keep praying that God opens up space to work in our lives, in our communities, in our nation and world. Let's pray there will be more God in our lives, not less. More opportunities, not less. Many new occasions and turning points on the journey that teach us new responsibilities that we may live up to them. And now receive this blessing, people of faith. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. Amen.